Hi, let's review chi-square theory just a bit. So let's say that uh, we're looking at um, gender and we have men and women. And let's say that we have 100 people in our study. If we have 100 people in our study and we think they're equally likely to be a man or a woman, then we would have guessed that maybe 50 would be a uh, woman and 50 would be a man. So what we see here is we're splitting them equally amongst both um, possibilities. Well, let's say that in reality, the data were something like um, 90 men and 10 women. We can see here that the pattern of what really happened isn't exactly matching the pattern of what we expected to happen. So we want to compare this 90 and 50 and compare the 10 versus 50 and see how much the pattern of what we observed deviated from what we expected. And that's what a chi-square does. So the chi-square calculation is going to take up those deviations. So first, we're going to look at our observed values minus our expected value. So we might do 90 minus 50, square that value, and then divide by the expected value. We're going to take this, sorry, this whole package here and sum them up for each box we have. And that's going to give us our chi-square value. Since these are about deviations, you can see if our values deviate, a lot, it's going to lend to a large chi-square telling us that our observed values didn't match what we expected if they were equally distributed. So now we can talk about what happens when um, we are doing two variables. So let's continue with uh, men and women, but then we can look at something like pass-fail. So let's say that we have um, 200 men and 100 women. And let's say that we have um, 150 students passing and 150 students failing. So if we were going to look at what we would expect to get in those things, let's first start with women. If we think that women are equally likely to pass and fail, um, we would expect 50 women to be in this box and 50 women to be in this box. See how we've taken that 100 score and split it evenly across the um, pass fail. Same with the males. If we have 200 males, we would expect 100 of them to be passing and 100 of them to be failing. Then we can look at what actually happened in reality. Let's say that 140 men passed the class and only um, 60 failed the class. And then let's say that 10 women passed the class and 90 of them failed the class. That would be dramatic and sad. This is just an example. What we're looking at here is how our observed value differed from what we expected. Now you'll notice that it still sums up to be that 150 pass and 150 fail. We still have 100 women and 200 men, but really what we're trying to see is if the pattern of the observed value is different from the expected value. So this test would also quantify these deviations, and a large number would signify um, um, that there's a deviation in pattern, that men and women are having a separate pattern. So what we're doing with this original view here is we call it a goodness of fit. Okay, the handwriting is messy, but that says goodness of fit. <laughs> what we're seeing is how well does my expected value, sorry, how well do my observed values fit what I expected if they were equally distributed? So how well do my um, pink values here, 90 and 10, fit what I expected, 50 and 50? This test here, where we're looking at two variables together, we call this a test of independence. And we're still following this idea of seeing how well the numbers fit, but what we're trying to do is really see if the pattern for women and the pattern for men was the same, so they're acting similarly, or are they acting independently? So men seem to have their own pattern and women have their own pattern. So when you're looking at two variables, you're doing a test for independence. When you're just looking at one variable, like in this case, gender, we're doing a goodness of fit.